Hello, you fine internet folks. Today, we're here at Oxide Computing Company. And I have with me, Brian. Hey, y'all. Who are you and what do you do at Oxide? I, hey, I'm Brian Cantrell, I'm the ZTO of Oxide Computer Company. We're, mm -hmm. we're here in our office here in Emeryville, our office and lab, kind of our playhouse here in, in Emeryville. Uh, we're a computer company. We, mm -hmm. uh, we're a, a modern computer company. We are a rack scale computer company. So mm. th this is the, the, the Oxide rack behind you. Uh, and what we have done, our, our observation mm -hmm. was, if you if you look at those folks deploying compute at scale, so, Amazon, Google, Hyperscalers, yeah. right, Meta, they all built their own computers. Mm -hmm. And I, we were, I was, along with my co-founder, were at a public cloud company, Joyent, that had been purchased mm -hmm. by Samsung. Interesting. It was interesting. And we were, when after Samsung bought the company, they were really trying to deploy at Samsung scale. Mm -hmm. And we were deployed on commodity gear. We were deployed yep. on, on Dell, Supermicro, some HPE, uh, some Arista. And uh, trying to match all that stuff oh, can be very difficult. Well, and we, when we hit scale, everything broke. Yeah. And we- I can imagine. Right, and, and to be fair, everything broke in hardware and software. But the difference is like with the software, we could actually go fix it. Mm -hmm. And we, we fixed a bunch of our software systems, but then the problems you're left with are those problems that are at that hardware software boundary. Mm -hmm. And it was pretty frustrating. And you look at like, how do these other folks do it? And you realize like they've actually done their own machines. And so yeah. what makes, if you, you want to, Show to the audience right. so the, one of these. This is an oxide sled. Um, and so this just doesn't look like a normal server computer. Right? No, it's no, so, it doesn't. It, it, it looks like a blade. It looks like a blade. Right. Um, and actually, if you look at the back, it even looks more like a blade. I'm going to take off the, the caption tape there. The um, So yeah, the, the, it blind mates into power, first of all. Okay. So, so we, like everybody running at scale, we run a DC bus bar up and okay. down the rack. So we, you've got an actual power shelf that mm -hmm. contains rectifiers. Those rectifiers then take you from AC to DC. You run DC on the bus bar. DC 48 volt? Uh, uh, yeah, 54 volt, yeah. Okay, 54. A, and the, the, the that is the way that everybody at scale runs with the DC Absolutely. bus bar. Mm -hmm. You can't buy a DC bus bar based machine from a <laughs> DC bus bar based rack from Dell, HP, Supermicro. No. And, th and they'll tell you that nobody wants it. Mm. it it's right, exactly. It's like, I don't think nobody wants it. Well, the fact that this exists tells me otherwise. But exactly, it definitely does. And you know, one of the things I've really appreciated because you, 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 you know, we kind of accreted the, the server architectures that we have. Mm -hmm. This traditional 1U2 architecture has accreted over time. Yeah. And it, it, until we kind of took a clean sheet of paper, you really don't appreciate just how many things are broken with it. So, yeah. I mean, one of the things that, that you know, you commented on is just like the noise. It's so yeah. much quieter. And, and it's, off, it's off camera right here, but there's one rack running right now over to, the, to my right side. It's, it, you can hear it, but it's, it's not a tinny noise. It's, it's, a, it's yeah. a very sort of almost like wind blowing noise, it, it, which it, is exactly what it is. Right, and that's exactly what it is. And you know what's funny is like, we, we didn't design this thing to be acoustically pleasant. It, it's, it just it, turned out like it, that. It just turned out like that. And one of the things you appreciate is like, when you look at the acoustic unpleasantness in a traditional mm -hmm. server, yes, you got a bunch that's coming from those small fans in the back. Mm -hmm. A bunch of it is also coming from those fans on the power supplies. Because mm. you've got those AC power supplies. And it's all like 40 mil fans. Th those are tiny fans. And they are, those AC power supplies, you take them apart, they're crammed. Yes. Right? And so there's a, a high static pressure that they have to overcome. Mm -hmm. Those fans are working hard. Yeah. And it's hot. And of course, like that fan is the thing that blows out on AC power supply. So you have two of them. Mm -hmm. So now we've got two AC power supplies in every one of these servers, all these power cords. And it's just like the whole thing's a mess. And that's just the beginning. A DC yeah. bus bar is just like, to me, the most basic thing. So speaking of, well, you say basic. Yeah. Uh, do you... The way a computer is booted yes. is you, you usually start with what's known as a basic input-output system, Ugh, aka God, the bias. bias. Yeah. Now, in the early 2000s, I was replaced by UEFI. UEFI, yes. Um, and, uh, also known I, as Itanium's UEFI. gift to the world. Yeah. Um, and while that works perfectly fine for your average laptop yeah. uh, or your average desktop, when you get to this scale... It doesn't make sense. Why is that? It, because it, it's giving you this kind of optionality that you actually don't want. 
right? Mm. The, like I actually, when you have something of this scale, it, mm -hmm. You actually, and, and we have co-designed our, our host operating system with our hardware. You don't need that optionality of booting kind of, I don't need to boot DOS on this thing, right? I, I, I don't <laughs> well, need, You don't want DOS on 60 right, different right, machines? Right, right, okay, that would be kind of entertaining. <laughs> um, but we, we, we actually don't need any of that. But we have preserved all of this kind of ancient optionality mm -hmm. in the BIOS. Um, a big problem that we had with the BIOS is that the BIOS has to boot the system in order to boot the system. So one of the things that the mm. BIOS has to do is it has to like power, because it needs to find like, how do I boot this thing? I need to actually do IO yep. to pull a boot image off of somewhere. Well, it's like IO, as we know, like everything's complicated, right? Yeah. It's just like, well, you can't just like do IO. Like we actually have to bring up PCIe engines mm -hmm. and then bring up all the CPUs. So you're doing all this work to boot the system. And then you find the image that you want to boot, and now you have to be like, okay, we have to pretend like we were never here. So it then tries to actually set what we, we call sending the machine backwards, where it looks makes the machine look like it has not been booted when it executes that first that first operating system instruction. Mm -hmm. But in reality, an entire city has been constructed <laughs> and plowed under. <laughs> And, it, and, and, and that operating system can actually see the artifacts of that over time. There's mm. something called system management mode, SMM. Ah, yes. Yeah, right. And SMM... Yeah, what, what some people <laughs> refer to as ring minus two, if I remember correctly. That's right, ring minus two. And you, the, the, that kind of platform initialization layer can mm. stuff whatever it wants in SMM. I still find it hilarious that what... I think it was HP tried putting like a day calendar oh my God. in the SMM. Right, right, right. right, we're trying to boot the BIOS. So it's just like, why are you doing this? And, and <laughs> it's like they're doing it because they wanted to add value to their hardware uh -huh. without controlling the system software. So the way to do that is to like jam that software into the system software they do control, which is SMM. But from, a, from the perspective of actually running this thing as a server, mm -hmm. it's like, that's just a problem for me. I, so, I don't want to have ring minus two. So for us, SMM is empty. If, 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 because the other thing is like, the, the, why do you end up in SMM? Mm -hmm. For any reason, right? I mean, yeah. if, if you look at the architecture manual, it's like it can go into SMM yeah. for like any reason, can stay there for any length of time. It's yes. like unspecified, yeah. effectively. And so yeah. how do you solve this? So for us, if you, we do have something in SMM mode. Mm -hmm. If you ever hit SMM mode, we panic the system because okay. under no condition should we enter SMM. So okay. if, if we enter system management mode, we bring the system down and take a crash dump. Okay. Uh, um, we haven't done, uh, that would be pretty wild if we ever saw that happen, right? Because it would mean <laughs> that they, but we have not seen that happen. Um, it, and we wanted to do that to make sure that we, if something were to errantly mm -hmm. enter system management mode, but we don't use system management mode at all. We also didn't want to have a bias at all. Yep, so how are you getting around that? Yeah, so that was tough. Um, and in fact, I, this is something that we didn't really appreciate at the time. AMD didn't think we could pull this off. Um, mm -hmm. Apparently, Google tried this and failed. And hmm. if Google has tried something and failed, yeah. it must be impossible for humanity. Well, <laughs> yes. well, oftentimes what they do is they succeed and they claim that they failed and then just <laughs> right. cancel the product. <laughs> exactly. That's right. So um, we, but it, and it was tough. It required us to work very closely with AMD. Mm -hmm. um, I think that AMD didn't really believe that we could pull it off. Well, uh, to, it's to not, their, it's far, from, it's, it's, I wouldn't even say not a trivial, it's a very complicated problem. It is, because you are doing that lowest layer of platform initialization. And, and that's, that platform initialization, people forget, is like memory training. It's like bringing up the PCIe. That's right. And, and remember, what's bringing up the system? Well, oftentimes it's something, like if you try and access a BMC, that BMC is on a PCIe bus. That's right. Like it has to be brought up and initialized so there's a lot of complex problems. Speaking here. of the BMC, we also threw that <laughs> into the C. So the, the, the we the, the BMC, the baseboard management controller, mm -hmm. the computer within the computer, we felt that the BMC had had grown far too large, far too complicated. Mm -hmm. BMC should not be on PCIe. There's no uh, the, uh, from our perspective. Mm -hmm. It's like there's no what what you actually want is environmentals. You want power control. Mm -hmm. You want, it needs to be on its own network. Um, and that's basically it. You want it. Mm -hmm. to, I mean, its job is to really hand the host CPU its cup of coffee. And and so we we I wish I had somebody that hands me my cup of coffee no, in the water. That's right. So we eliminated the BMC and mm -hmm. we we replaced that what we call the service processor, the SP, kind of okay. going back to kind of an older model. So if you look at at this compute sled here, and I, it may be hard to see in there, but we've got the that's our service processor. So mm -hmm. the, um, the, this is a, um, a, a, a ST microelectronics part. Um, and this is a, a part that is kind of funny because this doesn't need a heat sink, mm -hmm. right? 
this is a 400 megahertz part, this is, mm. which is faster than the, than the then, machines were yeah. when I was coming up by a oh, long yeah. shot. Like faster than the first, the first workstation that I had at Sun Microsystems it's, by a it's, long shot. It's what, 80 times faster than the original x86? Th that's right, the yes. 8086, yeah. So, so. so it's like, why are we taking this kind of BMC and running this multi-user operating system on it when we actually have got plenty of compute power there? Mm -hmm. We did our own operating system. So when, mm. one thing that we, we we took a clean sheet of paper there as well. I think we were we were looking around for for kind of uh, best of breed, but we weren't finding anything that we liked exactly. Uh, one of the things that we were not finding is because operating systems have this kind of multi-user heritage where they know how to load programs, mm -hmm. which makes sense. Yes, but, absolutely. Like, and the idea that an operating system can load a program that has never seen before makes it valuable. Yeah. It I mean, makes it usable. Right? I mean, if you think about it, every time you power a system off and you reboot the OS, essentially the OS goes, I'm brand new, and then you, you go to load, let's say, Steam, for example. It doesn't know what Steam is. Right, yes, right? exactly. So the OS has to figure out the program and, and boot it. Right. right. And so even in microcontroller based operating systems, they still have this idea of like program loading. Mm -hmm. We actually didn't, we wanted programs, but we don't want to load foreign programs on this. No. We, we want all of the things that are, that are in this, we want it to be aware of when it actually boots. So, mm -hmm. we, so Hubris is our operating system. Um, I, 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 I love, I love the, the names Hubris and then uh, humility is for the debugger. So, okay. so, so uh, Cliff Bethel, the engineer who pioneered Hubris, um, th this is of course one, one of the the dead leaves sins of programmers, right? Um, the uh, but but the, the kind of the idea of being a nod to the fact, like, oh my God, you're doing your own operating system. The Hubris mm -hmm. of doing your own yeah. operating system, um, and then of course the debugger for that is humility. Um, the uh, and, and what's been interesting is that that kind of model. Mm -hmm. And Cliff has got a great talk um, at OSFC. Mm. Uh, my colleague. Matt Keeter also did a terrific talk on some of the debugging infrastructure that we built around mm -hmm. this thing. Um, that model has allowed us to keep Hubris as, as a very tight image. So Hubris knows about all the tasks that it's mm -hmm. going to run when it actually boots. That image has every task in it. It does not load foreign programs, mm. which is what you want in this kind of firmware. Yeah, you, you don't want somebody to be able to even, so let's say if I got physical access. That's right. Could I change that? If you got, okay, so if you, the great question. If you got physical access, you could load a new image on here. Okay. But then the, there's a root of trust on here. Mm. That root of trust would know that that image, unless you were Oxide doing it, mm -hmm. it would know that image has actually not been signed by Oxide. So we now, can actually attest the image. Uh, can you, so let's say I get access somehow to just a single node. Yeah. Or I only have time to mess with a single node. Yeah. You have a single node in a, in a big rack. Could you like re essentially download a new system image for that microcontroller. Could you, you could create your own image, but it would know that this is not an oxide image. No, no, I mean, so the system knows it's not an oxide image. Yes. Can it then pull an image, a good, a known good image off a different slot? Oh, yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. So the, the, well, now you need to have enough to actually get over a service processor network. So you, you have to kind of qualify just how crippled this image is. Mm -hmm. um, you can definitely, if you put a brick on here, it's going to be a problem. Uh, so we, <laughs> so as a result, like we're, as a practical matter, very careful about that. Mm -hmm. So we, we've got, there are A and B sides to yep. that microcontroller. So if you do put a bad image on, it can roll back to the other one and so on. Absolutely. Um, but so, the, and, and again, this thing is really designed it is fit to purpose mm -hmm. for booting and operating a computer. Unlike a BMC, which is really designed to make a server look like a desktop. Yep. And I think, well, we're probably running quite long here, but uh, <laughs> one last question. Yeah. Always my last question. What's your favorite type of cheese? Ooh, that's a good question. You know, I, um, God, I mean, I love a good sharp cheddar. I know this is. Ooh, I, 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 I agree with you on that one. Okay, and actually, you know, my kids really. I also really like Swiss and 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 not just Swiss cheese, but Swiss cheese, mm -hmm. Swiss cheeses. Um, so a good Emmentalier, something like that. Mm -hmm. um, is also, but my, uh, my kids are less into that. But yeah, I, I'm, I, I guess I'm maybe pretty traditional in that regard. I I 100% agree. Well, thank you so much, you bet. Brian, for you. for this. Uh, thank you for watching. Um, like, hit subscribe, do all that, comment. It really does help the algorithm and we must appease the algo gods. So uh, thank you so much. Thank you. Have a good one. Have a good one, folks.